All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, John Boyk, who is an author of several excellent books on training, which we'll get into, and also uh, one of my favorite market historians, always bringing up some amazing quotes on Twitter, which I really enjoy. Uh, so, John, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, and welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you. And to, to kick things off, I'd love to just dive a little bit into your background, and that should kind of transition naturally to talking about uh, your work as a market historian and writing your excellent books as well. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this the other day. How did this all begin for me? So I, I actually remember being like a 12-year-old boy or somewhere in that, uh, around that age, me and my friend sitting on his porch one day talking about what do we want to be when we grow up? And um, we started talking about what did our parents do? And his father owned a small convenience store, which he did pretty good with. But he was also saying that, um, yeah, my dad's in the stock market too. And I'm like, the stock market, what is that? Um, and he's like, well, he owns Kmart. And I'm like, he owns Kmart? How cool is that? I mean, at 12 years old, that was the place to be, right? That was the coolest place on earth. Because no, he doesn't own Kmart, but he owns the stock of Kmart. So he described that a little bit. And I just read. I just remember thinking that is the coolest thing I've ever heard. And then I said to him, I think I'm going to do that someday. So, I mean, that was a long, long time ago. So for me to be, even be able to remember that, I think that may have planted the seed for all this stuff going forward. Who knows? But um, so to go back to, you know, what did we want to be? Mine was easy. I wanted to be a pro baseball player or a pro hockey player. And as you can see, that didn't work out. So. <laughs> Then I went to my uh, first concert as a teenager, a first rock concert. And of course, then I wanted to be a rock star and uh, the band didn't go that very, didn't go very far. So then it's off to college because uh, I grew up in the Detroit area and my whole family was in the auto industry. And I mean, I love cars, but I didn't want to be in that industry for work uh, purposes. So off to college and had an interest in business. And so when I got to junior, senior year, I really narrowed that down to finance and I had some courses on investments and we were reading the Wall Street Journal and I just loved all that. And then I said, after graduating, I said, okay, now I know what I wanna be. I wanna be the best stockbroker in history. That was my goal, okay? So I landed a job with this company called Ovi Discount Stockbrokers. Now this is in the mid eighties. So, you know, I'm an old dinosaur here, so. This is in the mid 80s and OB Discount based out of Detroit was one of the leading discount brokerage houses at the time. And discount brokerage was just really starting to take off then. So I landed a job there and as a green rookie, you get to work in the quote department. And we had these little quote machines. Uh, we called them the green screen quote machines. And you just sit there and you take calls and some guy calls in and goes, what's GM trading at? And you have to learn the ticker symbols and you punch it into this machine. And it's like, whatever it was, 42 bucks. And, you know, three minutes later, the guy, same guy calls back, what's GM at? 42 and an eighth, whatever the, back then it was eighths and versus decimals. So, you know, and then five minutes later, he calls back again. And then, you know, at some point he'll say, transfer me to the order department. So the quote department, and then um, probably doing that for several months or so, trying to remember that. And then my boss comes to me one day and he says, I need to talk to you. Ernie Oldie, who owned the discount brokerage house, he said he's creating a new service. He wants to offer brokerage services to banks. And that wasn't really happening back then. So he chooses my boss to start the program. My boss chooses me to run it up with him. Now I'm this you know, you know, young 20 year old, uh, early 20s. And I say, yeah, that'd be great. So we, what we did was we contacted all these uh, banks throughout the US. It was great. I got to fly all over the country and we pitched this product to these uh, bank presidents. And it was an easy sell because everybody won. The bank won because they got to offer a new service and it didn't cost them anything. Uh, the customer of the bank wins because now you can buy stocks through banks and Oldie wins because he gets the commission off the, off the trade. 
So the program was very successful. It was one of the first ones to offer that service, discount brokers through, through the banking system. So we did that, it was a great success. I come back to the office and then I graduated to the order department. But I kept thinking, um, you know, that was such an easy sale. But what I really wanted to do was be this stock broker. So I studied for my series seven and my blue sky laws exams and I passed both on the first try. And so as soon as I did that, I quit oldie and I jumped to a full service firm. And that was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. Because then it's like, uh, we were pretty middle class growing up and the boss is like, how many rich people do you know? And I'm like, none. So he's like, tosses me the phone book and it's like, here, dial for dollars. And it's just calling people all day long and people telling you where to go and <laughs> calling you every name in the books, you know, leave me alone. And when you finally got somebody who was interested, all you were doing was pitching the stock of the week for the brokerage firm. So, I mean, any robot could have done this. And after months of that, I just got so discouraged with it. Um, I actually quit. I just, I went in one day and I told my the branch manager, I said, I, I can't do this anymore. It's not what I wanted to do. And I said, I'm just gonna give the probably two leads that I had to the guys in the bullpen. That's what they called that with all the brokers out there. So um, after that, it was like, now what? So I had like 500 bucks to my name and a buddy of mine from college had recently moved to Florida. And he said, man, John, you got to come down here, the weather, the beaches, et cetera. So I said, maybe that's what I need to uh, clear my head. And I drove down to Florida and for a week and actually I never came back. So stayed down there and made, had a couple, you know, piddly, jo piddly jobs. And then I got a, uh, became a finance manager for a computer reseller and then just worked my way up. I, what I decided to do was I left the brokerage industry, which I should not have. Um, I really wanted to stay, stayed on the re trading side, but I just couldn't stand the sales side. Of it. So I decided to turn my knowledge into managerial finance and became a controller for several private companies throughout you know, the next 30 years or whatever. And I just cut those cords now. So now I have full time to, to do the market recently. But um, I always kept an eye and an ear to the market, even while I was running my career. And I always was, I was always doing that. And I remember, but I had no idea what I was doing. So I went on this knowledge quest and I started reading, uh, I was still reading the Wall Street Journal. And this is the mid nineties now, mid to late nineties. And all you kept hearing about was how high the stock market's going and all these guys are doing great and I'm not making any progress. And I'm like, so I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing everything wrong, it seemed like. I mean, for example, I remember one day watching CNBC and some guy's on the program and he says, I think this stock is going to do this. This sector is going to be hot and whatever. And I'm sitting there watching that and I said, I need a stock from that sector. I called up my broker and I just bought it. Whatever he said, I didn't even, I didn't even know what the company did. I didn't know what the chart looked like. I didn't know anything about it. And I just bought it blindly from this guy's recommendation. Um, you know, taking tips and opinions from others. So I lost on that, I think it went down 20% in two weeks. <laughs> I, I dumped it and I was just like, I'm doing everything wrong. And so I'm reading, I probably bought a hundred books on the market, anything that had the stock market word in it, I bought it and I read it and I'm pretty, I'm pretty much a speed reader. So I read them quick. And my favorite one at the time was Peter Lynch's book, One Up on Wall Street, but, or Beating the Street or both of them, I can't remember back then, but um, I remember, then I remember I was on a, I was on a business trip and I'm on an airplane and some guy had left behind in the pocket of the uh, seat an Investor's Business Daily newspaper. So I picked it up. I didn't even know what it was. I read that thing from front to back. And there's pieces in there, of course, if you don't know IBD, that, you know, uh, proprietary to them. So I didn't know what everything meant, but they had the charts and everything. And I just said to myself, this is completely the opposite of what I've been doing. So maybe this is it. So I get home, 
I do a lot of research on IBD and find out William O'Neill's part of that. Uh, who's this guy, William O'Neill? I mean, I didn't know any of this. And now we're like late 90s. So I buy how to, uh, you know, how to make money in stocks. And I read through it very quickly. I didn't study it enough. So I read through it and I got a, a subscription to IBD. And now we're like, it's 1999 and the market is just ripping. Um, once it finds out, you know, Y2K, I guess, you know, I guess the lights will come on and all that kind of stuff. So I'm buying stocks out of IBD, but I still don't know what I'm doing. There's no timing. There's no sell rules or nothing. And, but I'm making money and I'm like, wow, this is completely opposite to doing all those other years. But what happens is in 2000, then spring 2000, the market starts to correct and it comes down pretty hard. And I round tripped that whole thing I did in 99. I had no sell rules. I didn't know what, still what I was doing. So I was like, well, I made some money, but then I gave it all back. And that's not the right thing to do. So classic boom and bust. And I probably had five or six of those high tech stocks. And they, you know, they came down and I, I just gave back everything I earned plus some, some others. So I was like, but I never blew up my account because I was, I never wanted to go to zero, of course, nobody does. But I was like, I had to get out of this. And then I said, I'm still doing something wrong. So I went back and I reread how to make money in stocks. And I took my time this time. I was like, oh, there's all these other parts to sell rules and everything else. And then I started doing research in O'Neill. And it's through that book. He's like, you know, he recommends Darvis's book and Livermore's book and Gerald Loeb. He was a big, um, you know, fan of his. And I was like, I didn't, when I was reading those hundred books on the market, I didn't come across any of those really. So I went on this second massive knowledge quest. I went and read all the old books that those guys read. So the next one I read was Darvis's book. And that just hit a home run for me. I was like, this makes so much sense. And I made all the same stupid mistakes that Darvis made. And so we all go through that learning process and it's just like, but I couldn't seem to get out of it. I mean, I was, I think I mentioned this the other day, Richard, when we spoke for a little bit, I actually wrote a letter <laughs> to, I think I still have it. I was so frustrated. I was like, it kind of went like, dear stock exchange, please don't accept any more trade orders from John Boyd. He's a total idiot who has no idea what he's doing. Sincerely, John Boyd. <laughs> so, I never sent the letter, but I still have it as a reminder. It's like, stop making these mistakes. So we all go through that. All these great traders that I studied went through it. Um, but I went on this second knowledge quest, reading Darvis, then reading Loeb. And I kind of went backward to the beginning and read Baruch and read a little bit on Dreyfus and read Livermore and just swallowed up everything. I was just bought all these books, re I read them more than once. And it hit me that I was like, look, these guys all wrote these great books and they all had these great successes in the market. And what intrigued me the most was this went back over a hundred years. And I was reading on Wyckoff and that this is the 1890s when Baruch started. And I'm like, O'Neill uses a lot of these same things. These guys are doing the same type of strategies. They tweaked them a little bit to match their personality, but I was like, how come I didn't know this before? And, and I was just astonished that these commonalities in their strategies were all similar. And it didn't matter what time frame it was. It went back over a hundred years. So I as I'm getting a little more knowledgeable on this, I kept pulling these, those books off my shelf and going, what did he do again? Hey, Loeb did that, or Wyckoff did that. And I was just, why, didn't, why, why isn't there a book out there that combines all these, God, just short profiles. I mean, their books are phenomenal and everybody should read those. But why isn't there, I was looking for the cliff notes of the stock market. You know, I'm looking for the Holy Grail. I mean, I searched and searched and I was like, there's got to be the Holy Grail answer in here somewhere. And so I said, why, is, why didn't somebody put a book together that 
showed this timeline of these, these guys and their similarities. So I researched that, I couldn't find anything. And then I said, I'll do it. And uh, you know, I told my wife and she's like, what? You're gonna write a book? You don't know how to write a book. I'm like, I think I can sketch this out, you know? So um, I'm talking to my mom one day and I told her and she says, oh, that's a great idea. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna send you something in, in the mail. So I get, you know, a couple of days later, I get this thing in the mail. She sends me this letter from the Detroit News when I was 14 years old. I won a scholastic writing contest. I have no clue what it was about. I don't remember anything about it. And I was like, like wow, this, thanks, mom, you know, pumping me up for this. And I said, uh, I don't know what that paper was about. I can guarantee it wasn't about the stock market. You know, maybe it was about being a baseball or hockey player or being a rock star. I don't know. Anyway, that gave me the confidence to put that book together. And so let me back up to the slide you're showing here, uh, the learning the lessons from history. So I, I'm taking all this history knowledge in and finding out all these commonalities. And O'Neill here says, I just love this, this quote, you can always learn from history because human nature doesn't change. And he did it too. He studied Lowe, he studied Livermore, he studied Baru. Then you back up and Darvis studied Loeb. And there's a guy named Humphrey Neal who wrote one of the top 10 books. We'll get to that a little later that I love, which was written in the 1930s called Tape Reading and Market Tactics. And so I'm like, okay, O'Neill studied all these history guys before him. Um, Darvis studied all these history guys before him. Then Loeb, he knew Baruch and they exchanged ideas. So he learned from him. Um, there was Livermore. Livermore and Baruch knew each other and worked off each other. And then there was Wyckoff up there too. Wyckoff knew Livermore and interviewed him several times to learn from him. So I'm like, all these guys learned from each other. That's why there's similarities between them, but they tweaked them to their own thing. So What's the value of learning from history? If all those guys did it, then I'm gonna do it too. So I'm putting this book together. So if you wanna to switch to the next slide. Um, I, yeah, so I put this book together. It's the one on the left and I go to Kinko's, which is, isn't even around anymore. And I said, I want you to make this like a paperback book. And so I designed the cover. <laughs> it's, look, I mean, look at that thing, but... Um, so I made it like a book, made a couple copies of those, and I found out that O'Neill was doing an advanced seminar out in California. And I said, well, I'm going to go to that seminar, and I'm going to give him a copy of this book. I just want to see what he thinks of it. So I wrote a little letter, put it in the book, and I fly out to California and um, uh, get ready for the, the conference, you know, the registration desk for the IBD people. And they're like, uh, what's that? And I said, this is a book I wanna give to William O'Neill. And they're like, well, you can give it to us. We'll give it to him. And I'm like, oh, no. I, didn't, I didn't fly halfway across the country to do that. I'm gonna give it to him myself. And they're like, well, good luck. You, you won't get access to him. Not like he wasn't accessible, but back then, so this is 2003 or something. And um, you know, he had a little bit of security. And this was a big, this was a big seminar. There's probably three, 400 people there. And uh, so I said, no, I'm gonna take my chance. So and here I am stalking the goat, right? And, uh, first break, I see him, he goes around, you know, backstage or wherever he was. And so I take off and take off down the aisle thing. And then I'm running backstage. And you know, I think there was a rope back, I hop a rope and I'm like, I'm going to find him. Couldn't find him, but there was like one security guard in the back. And I'm like, where'd he go? And uh, I turn around and there he is. And he's like, hi. And I go, hey, I go, Mr. O'Neill. I said, I know I have two minutes of your time. If I can have that, please. I said, um, here's a book I wrote. Uh, I gave it to him. I said, you're in it. All your heroes are in it. And he looked at the cover and he's like, huh, God, that's kind of interesting. And I said, you know, if you have two minutes of your life, could you please just look through it and tell me if it's any good, what you think? I have a letter in there. And you know, by that time the security guard was like, what are you doing here? 
kicking me out. And so I'm like, okay, fine. So back to the session. Um, it was a great session. After the whole session, I kind of followed him again, you know, the stalker here of the traders. And uh, I just, I noticed he still had the book in his hand when he left. So I was like, oh, good. He didn't burn it during lunch, you know, so maybe I got a shot. So I go back home. Um, a month to, to the day, I'm at work. My wife calls me. She goes, John, some guy's looking for you from McGraw Hill. So I'm like, okay, McGraw Hill. I'm like, McGraw Hill. Oh my gosh, it's got to be about the book. So I call this guy up and I said, hey, I'm John. You were looking for me. He called my house. He goes, he goes so you're John Boyd. You wrote this book. I go, I go yeah. And he goes, um, well, William O'Neill sent it to us and he wants us to publish it. Whatever he wants, he gets. I mean, his book was so, you know, a million copies or so. So I was like, oh my gosh. And he's like, um, so who are you? And I said, I'm a nobody. Like, yeah, we know that. <laughs> so, uh, but tell us how this all got started. So I told that story again. And then that's how that came about. So I got an editor and the book came out. It did really well. Barron's chose it as one of the top 25 books of the year. And because of that, McGraw-Hill calls me back and they're like, okay, rookie, um, this is like you went up to bat for your first major league at bat and you hit a double. So you got lucky. You got any other ideas? And I'm like, actually, I do. I said, I want to dig in a little further. Instead of just focusing on these guys, let's focus on, let me dig a little deeper and look at the time periods, what the market was doing while they were active in the market. So if you want to flip to the next one. So what I did here was I took each chapter and I made it a decade in the market and all the decade, of course, every decade is going to be different. But I, for this one, I had to go back and I read a bunch of history books on Wall Street and found these common denominators that move the market all the time. And we'll get to those in a little bit because we're seeing the same thing happening today. It's going to happen all the time. But in inside these decades of the chapters are those guys. I put... Um, Livermore in there. And I added uh, Richard Wyckoff and I added Jack Dreyfus because O'Neill studied Dreyfus and Wyckoff was close to Livermore and Baruch. So every chapter in there talks about these guys and how did they sidestep the declines in those periods and how did they jump on those uptrends and what did they do in the sideways markets and how did they do it and what stocks did they want? So while I'm putting that thought together, I'm reading IBD and there's a huge, it's a one page, a whole one page story on this guy named Jim Rowe. And I'm like, oh, what a story this guy has. You know, he, he struggled for this first seven, eight years. He was a broker, et cetera, et cetera. He read O'Neill's book like 30 times, he said, and then he just got, he, he lost everything. He had to take an inheritance. And most of these guys did that. Loeb did the same thing when he started out. He lost everything he had and his mother had to sell her jewelry to give him money to get back into the market. So, I mean, all these guys, you have to lose to know how to win. That's how I always say that. So it helps to go through some tough times uh, and then turn yourself around. But I'm reading this story on Ropel and I'm like, this guy's story needs to be told. And then it talks about how he, really hit it big in 99 and into 2000, but he saw the top coming in March of 2000. And he went from 200% margin to 100% in cash in like two days and sold right at the top, multi-million dollar account and then retired. And I'm like, gosh, this is like, this is the modern day Darvis story. So, I like, I need to get a hold of this guy. I want to put him in this other idea book I have. So there was another um, O'Neill IBD workshop. And I said, I know he's going to be there. I'm going to go to that one. I think it was in California as well. So I fly out there again, go to another shop, and I come in. And this is like just months after this article had come out. And I walk into the uh, you know, auditorium where it is, and it's another big show. And there's a bunch of people around this table and I'm like, oh, that's, 
Robles got to be there. And so I zip my way through there and yep, there he is. And here I am stalking a trader. <laughs> so I'm like, you're Jim Ropel. I loved your story. I said, I just, I came out with this. I had a business card with that first book cover on. I said, O'Neill helped me get this book out. And I want to do the second one. I want to dig really deep into history and how these traders made this. And you need to be in this 1990s, 2000s chapter. What do you want to be in? He's like, and I think a lot of you know Jim. He's so upbeat and optimistic. He's like, heck yeah, man, I want to do it. And I said, that's great. And I said, uh, can we meet after the conference? He goes, yeah, let's go to the bar and have a couple beers or whatever. And I said, that's great. So we did that and he agreed to do it. So I said, well, I need to fly up to Chicago from where, he, where he's from. And I want to interview you while you're working. I just want to observe you and see how, it, how you do all this. So I get up there and he's just the greatest guy in the world. You know, he's, I meet his family, I go to his home. He shows me everything. We go to his office, the first thing, I noticed when we walk in, he had this huge wall chart of the market, all history, I think it was back to 1900, marked up of all the uptrends and all the downtrends and the stocks that led it, the stocks that led it back down, et cetera, et cetera. And then the office is filled with these old chart daily graphs, chart books from IBD when they used to do them in paper. And he re, he re, he views these all the time. And I'm like, here's another guy studying history, find out where he is today. So, and you want an entertaining day, sit with Ropel while he's trading during the day. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching. And he's like, he's like, he calls people this all day. Mr. Big, I got to take this call. I got to, I go, Jim, pretend like I'm not even here. Don't ask for my commission, do your trades. And he's like, he's on the phone with the brokers and the floor and all this stuff. So it was very entertaining. I'm so glad he, he agreed to do it because his story is so inspiring. So I put him in that book and that went through all of the, uh, the decades. So if you wanna move to the next slide. So in that is, there's lots of references to, this is from there, like these guys, Baruch and Livermore and Loeb and Dreyfus and O'Neill. And what I highlighted here was how they, study history of the market and how they used it from the past that looked similar to what their current day had been. And so we won't go through this whole slide, but there's all uh, periods in here where this top looked similar to this one. And that's how Livermore would always, that's how he found the top in 29. Cause it looked like it was in, what did I say there? Oh, three. And so these guys all did the same things. They studied market history because it goes through the same cycles over and yeah. over again. And I was just intrigued by this as like, oh, another, another um, arrow in the quiver for learning how, to, how history works in the market. And so Baruch and Livermore and Loeb and Wyckoff, all four of those guys were out of the market before the market crashed in October 21. Now, everybody thinks that a lot of people who had studied history think that that market started crashing in October of 29. That's not true. The top of that market was actually in early September. And Loeb saw that and Baruch saw that. And these guys, Livermore actually shorted the market and made a massive payday back in that day. But Loeb was, um, he was totally out of the market six weeks before October hit. He wasn't even in the United States when the great crash hit in late October of 29. He was on a six week European vacation, 100% cash. And he made big money in the late 20s. He made 2 million bucks on Montgomery Ward alone. So I think Loeb is a little underrated. A lot of people don't talk about him. But he was in the market for 50 years, from the 20s to the 1970s. And he never blew up. And he, he, he probably did the one feat that I think is the greatest that, I've, that I can remember in market history. He was positive in 1929, 1930, 31, and 32. The biggest bear market in history with the Dow down 89% in that time frame. Loeb was positive. Every single one of those years, 
from the long side. He never shorted stocks. What he did in 30, 31, and 32 was every time a rally came up, he would get in it and he tightened up his time plan. So we can get to that a little later. But the point of this slide is that all these guys studied history before them to help them sidestep downturns in the market and also to get in when the next upturn came around. And it wasn't just the market, they studied the stocks that did it. So O'Neill, um, there's a great story about him. Uh, we'll get to that slide in a minute, but he studied all those history stocks. You know, he did the, the model book of great stocks, which goes back to the 1900s, actually 1890s, the first cup and handle base that, that he saw. So these guys all did it. They did the same thing. And so that's why I did this book. I wanted to help others with, it helps to, to understand the history from these great successful traders. They all learned from how markets go through cycles. They learned how stocks go from tops to bottoms. They go from leaders to laggards and et cetera, et cetera. So that's how it, that's what happens. So there's a lot of interesting things. And I was just going back the other day, I was reading the seventies chapter because there's a lot of similarities in some of the seventies periods that look like a lot like what we're doing today. You got inflation, high inflation, you got rod, the Fed raising interest rates and et cetera, et cetera. GDP looks like it's coming down. We might be in a recession. And this has happened so many times in history. And if you understand that, it'll help you get through this. A lot of those guys went to cash or they shorted stocks. Darvis didn't short stocks, Loeb didn't short stocks, and O'Neill did it on a very limited basis but they protected their capital from the uptrends that they had. And uh, we can talk a lot more about that a little later, but um, that's what that book is about. I hope it helps people. Um, so the next slide would be, um, oh yeah, this is the one I was trying to talk about. O'Neill's second book is his other great book, The Successful Investor. <clears throat> Here's what he says. What did he do to turn his results around? He studied the very best people before him. That's why I mentioned this before. He studied Jack Dreyfus. That's where O'Neill learned how to um, read charts and buy stocks breaking through and making new highs. Dreyfus was doing that. And Dreyfus outperformed every single mutual fund manager in the late 50s. Way before Peter Lynch in the 70s was doing that, Dreyfus was doing that in the late 50s, doing that by break, buying stocks, breaking out to new highs, running them up, and then selling them when the sell signals showed up. And then there's O'Neill again with, with Loeb. He actually met Loeb at one point and um, he studied him extensively. He talks about him a lot. And then Livermore, of course. Um, and then he said, the second thing he did to turn his, his results around was studied his mistakes. O'Neill started in the early 60s and he round tripped his, his results in 61 as well. And he couldn't figure out why, why did I do that? I mean, I didn't have, he didn't have any sell rules. So he went back for every trade he made and said, what did I do wrong? How did I lose money on that? What did I miss? Or how did I miss the opportunities that I didn't take advantage of? So he wrote all those rules. He created rules for himself that were similar to the rules the other guys did, but they fit his personality a little bit better. O'Neill was a stickler for details, and we'll get to that in a minute too. Um, but then look at the third um, thing he did to turn his results around. He cut out and collected 50 charts of the top performing stocks from all prior years and studied these stocks looking for the fundamentals, that were common in the for the price and volume action before they doubled in price. And he's created this model book. This, this, he was the first one to create the computer database back in the 60s, late 60s, to uh, put all this together in, in a computer format. And he was the first one to combine in charts the fundamental statistics of the stocks too. So, his research, I call him the chairman of research. I mean, nobody in my mind has studied the market more than that guy. 
And the only way he got there was by studying what happened before him. So it's just another reason why I think history is so important. So, so then after that, so my books are a progression. I talk about, I profile these five great traders over a hundred years that at least one of them was active in the market every year for a hundred years. And a lot of, some of them overlapped each other. So it's a progression from who they were and their commonalities to then diving in a little deeper in what was the market doing in their time frame? And if you go back to that second book, all those chapters, there are, I think I mentioned this already, there's uptrends and downtrends within each decade. And how did they do it? So it maneuvers them through those, those market errors. So then I said, I need to take this one more step deeper. And so we did the who they were, what the market was doing. Now let's focus on the stocks. And how did they find these stocks? And how did they handle them when they had them? So if you want to flip to the next one, um, that's when I came up with um, the next uh, chart or slide rather. So that's when I came up with the monster stocks and I define that as a stock that doubles in price in a 12 month period. So we all want those, right? So, um, and I got O'Neill to um, endorse the cover, which was, that wasn't easy, but <laughs> um, he did it. And I just think that's the, one of the best quotes out there. Study past big winners and you'll buy future ones. Nobody knows that better than him. And so he kept doing that. And his, his book, his latest editions of How to Make Money in Stocks, the first, the first 100 pages are 100 charts of the best stocks over all that time frame, all, you know, those time periods of 100 years ago. So the monster stocks I started in, um, that looks at a 10-year period from 1997 to 06. I just wanted to pick a 10 year period. And uh, so that time frame, I wanted to do a, a, you know, a more modern time frame so people could under, you know, relate to those stocks better. So I picked that time frame because that time frame was also, we had, we had a raging bull market, in the late nineties. Then you had this massive bear market from the top, the beginning of 2000 down to 02. Then you had another up, nice uptrend in 03 and et cetera. Then you had choppy markets in 04, 05, 06. And so you have everything. So it's not just looking at, you know, just the best time or the worst time. It has every time. Just like any decade, like in that second book, every decade has those cycles through. It. So I wanted to dig in deep. And now let's focus on some of the best stuff. So I have a chap, there's a page in there, which is the one highlighted. And this is interesting too. So here's all those guys again in their timeframes. And I list the stocks where they made the most returns on. And this may surprise some people. There weren't many. I mean, they, they made the bulk of their gains in a few of the best stocks of their timeframe. They just, First of all, monster stocks don't come around all that often, but we'll get to that in a minute where, from the time frame we just had. So if you go through there, there's you know 10 or less that they made the bulk of their money. I, I mentioned Gerald Loeb earlier. Montgomery Ward was probably his big, one of his biggest winners. He made $2 million back in the 20s on just one stock. And then you'll see as they cross over time frames that a lot of them, because their strategies were similar, all landed the same stock. So let's look at, so Baruch, one of his big winners was Chrysler. Gerald Loeb, same thing. And you go down to O'Neill, same thing. You know why that is? Because the 62 market, when that bottomed, that, that was a pretty severe bear, bear market in 62. That market turned up in October of 62. And Chrysler, formed this beautiful cup and handle base. It had no overhead resistance to it. And it had a beautiful breakout right when the market 
turned up and started to take off. All three of those guys bought that stock on the exact same day, right through the breakout, right through the resistance point on volume. Also, the, the stock, I think I have the stock, the charts in the book, but it's in the book too. Um, but they rode that up. That was a leading stock coming around as the market came off a big bear market and they all landed the same one. Now, O'Neill sold out his earlier because he was just starting out then. Loeb and Baruch had been around a long time already. So O'Neill sold his Chrysler stock while it was up and, and sold it in the strength because he saw Syntex and it looked like a better, a better opportunity for him. And then he killed it on that one. So he took a great winner and made an even greater winner with Syntex. So the point is, these guys all saw the same thing because they, they knew what they were looking for. They knew coming off the bottom. I think Baruch was probably the best at that. He would wait out corrections. He, was, he did some shorting in his day. But when the market is bottoming and coming up and off a correction and he gets, he's looking at leadership coming in. And if it's strong, he buys into that. So he's buying off of a bottom, not at the bottom, off of a bottom when he sees an uptrend coming around the corner. So, and we can get to that a little later too. And then Ropel, of course, I got him down there. Broadcom's the one that really threw him over the top. But those are just winners for him. That was when that book was written in 07. Um, he's had many other big winners after that up to the present day. So, um, you know, he just keeps continued chugging along doing that. So Monster Stocks was that book to now drill down into the stocks that these guys did. And it talks about um, in that book, it's, it's O'Neill and Ropel because that's the time frame they were active at during the time that that book was written, that it looked at. And you could see them weaving in and out of these monster stocks. Ropel would be an Apple computer. I think it was in at three times. It would go up, he'd sell into strength, it would correct, and he'd be out. Then he keeps watching it, and it could be months, six months, nine months, whatever it was. It comes back up, it forms another base, breaks out, he's right on top of it again. So multiple times they're in these stocks, but they don't ride them down all the way. So, I mean, we're seeing some, some, uh, some mutual funds or hedge funds these days, you know, all those gains in 2020, just riding them back down, round tripping all that, all that money, 50% down or so on and so forth. These guys didn't do that. Once they got back out, once they got on track and they, created rules to keep them in the game and also importantly the sell rules that's how they made their successes so um so that's monster stocks so what's the the next slide is is what okay well um yeah we can talk about this now so researching all of that what has been learned from the legends and the market history and the historical stocks. So here's just some bullet points that we'll go through each one of these. Um, and you know, a lot of the traders you've had on this this uh, conference this weekend and last weekend, you know, we see this a lot. These these are top traders. They're doing they're doing this too. So these these are some of the key points to take into consideration and to really refine. If you're having trouble, which a lot of people can get into trouble. And just because you succeed at some point doesn't mean you can't fall back. I'm gonna give this quick example before we jump into this. I was looking up this the other day. So Baruch, um, 1927, 1928, the market is ripping high. Baruch is like, he's in GM and he says, I think GM is too high. Okay, now what's he, what's he doing wrong here? The market is ripping and he's making a personal opinion about GM. And he's been in the market for what, 30 years by now? Made a lot of money in the market. And he's like, no, this is too high. What's he, what, what does he do? He sells his position out and he shorts the stock. It goes against him, he shorts more. It goes against him again and he shorts even more. 
he lost 400 grand on that transaction when he finally realized, what am I doing here? I'm breaking all my rules and I'm not following the market. I'm going against it. So even if you're Bernard Baruch at that stage in your career, you can still make mistakes. We all do. This is a tough game. This is, um, you know, Gerald Loeb called his book, The Battle for Investment Survival. It is a battle. And um, it's not easy, but, you know, you learn from your mistakes and create rules that don't break or that you don't bend or break them. And I, that'll get you back on the right track. So, so back to this. So risk management, risk management is job number one. Limit your losses. Hope is not a strategy. I had that, you know, when I bought this stupid stock on CNBC, I just kept hoping, oh, it's going to come back. The guys on CNBC said it would. <laughs> so hope is not a strategy. Take your loss and get out. Um, accept the fact that you will be wrong more times than right. Um, O'Neill was, when I, when I was doing monster stocks and I had to send my edits back to William O'Neill because I wrote about him. And I, of course he had to approve what I wrote about him first. And I was like, I wonder how many times he's been right. So I put in there a, a number, I think. And he came back with the edits. He sent them back to me and he corrected it. He's, he said he was right like 65% of the time. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. I mean, to, 50% is impressive. 65, well, it's like, you're the goat, man. I mean, that's, that's what I thought. So, but you're still going to be wrong a lot. And um, it's to fix those times when you're wrong by taking your loss and going to the sideline and thinking about what you did wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, stay in sync with the market. We're seeing that today. And we're going to get to that in a little bit because there's a great example coming up. So make sure the wind is at your back. And then we're going to, this is something that I talk about a lot on Twitter. Uh, check the new high, new low levels to help determine the strength or weakness of the trend. Some people dismiss this. Um, and that's okay. But this is not something I made up by any stretch. This goes back decades. There was a book written in 1965 by Gilbert Haller. It's called The Haller Theory of Stock Market Trends. And Richard, I got that book from an interview you did with Williams. And he said that that book was the first book he ever bought that influenced him. And I was like, wow, I, I don't know about that book. So I, of course I go find it and I have to find the original. So I don't wanna, <laughs> and I like the original copies. And he has in that book, he's got 20 years of the Dow from 1942 to 1962 every year tracking the Dow average with the new high, new low numbers right below it. And the, they're totally in sync with each other. So he tracked that. Um, Alexander Elder, who has written some tremendous books on the market, Trading for a Living, et cetera. He wrote a whole ebook on this called The New High, New Low Index. And I highly recommend that. Gerald Lowe in his, not his books, there's a, there's a book on Loeb called The Wizard of Wall Street that was written by somebody else about him. It's a great biography. And that's where you get more of his trade secrets from than from his own personal book. Um, Loeb talked about that in that book where he would check that all the time. He would see if, if new lows are exceeding new highs by X, that's a, that's a bear mark or that's a correction mark. And so in the new book that I wrote that just came out this year, I correlate the 2020 and 2021 markets with that new high. I, I calculate this every day. And I just posted it last night on Twitter. I usually show it. I, I do it by hand on a calendar. And I write the, the net difference. I take the numbers from IBDs because they, they eliminate some of the junk stocks out there. So it's going to be different than a bar chart or a Wall Street Journal or whatever. But it just helps, it's a guidepost. It helps determine strength or weakness of a trend. And we'll get to some of that a little bit later. Um, then staying in sync with the market, hit the gas when the strong uptrend is in place. When all the averages are above their moving average line, 200, 50, 21, 10 days, that's when the market is ripping. And just 
for a side note too, back to the new high, new low. I showed half of July yesterday. We now have 25 days in a row where new highs, where new lows are exceeding new highs. The market currently peaked in mid-November of last year. From mid-November of last year to yesterday, 80% of the trading days have been negative. I say that, that means new lows exceed new highs. 80%, well, we're in a downtrend, of course. You can't, you can't be in a downtrend when more stocks are making new highs than new lows and vice versa. So 80%, that's a big number, and we're 25 days in a row. There were days, so that second point, hit the gas when the strong uptrend is this place. 2020, that uptrend started in April, mid-April of 2020, and ran up through the beginning of September. There were months in there, I'm trying to remember now here. I think May, June, and July, and most of August, there were, I think, 90 days in a row, not one single day was negative. New highs exceeded new lows every single day for over three months. That's a strong uptrend. So the point is, hit the gas when you're in a strong uptrend like that. And that's how a lot of guys and girls, uh, Eve was one of them too, made triple digit returns in 2020. So, I mean, that's when you, that's when you really want to be on that uptrend swing. So, so here's the thing. The next point is, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is the one thing that I saw when I was doing the history research for the second one, and I did all that market and analysis. There are three main economic issues that are anticipated or reflected by the market. Inflation, interest rates, and GDP. So keep an eye on it. They're making headlines every day today. The same thing that caused all the downtrends in the prior eras are causing the same thing today. We have high inflation, we have the Fed pumping the brakes, um, and we have GDP, we went negative, we'll probably do it again, et cetera. When those things turn around, and I mentioned this so many times in the, that second book, while the market is ripping, let's just go to 2020. Inflation was well-contained, interest rates were zero, and GDP was growing. You had this great uptrend. But the market always looks ahead. It looks ahead three, six, sometimes nine months in advance. So if the market starts turning up from where we are now, even though you might still be having high inflation numbers and negative GDP, the market looks ahead. And if the Fed starts mentioning, we're gonna slow down on the break, you probably will get an uptrend going there. But you know, we'll see what happens. But, Anyway, keep an eye on those three figures and you won't get too far off on what the market sees ahead. Again, it looks ahead all the time. So then I have choppy markets can grind you out and chop you up unless you're a master scalp and swing trader. And there are a lot of master scalp and swing traders out there that do very well. Um, I'm working on that myself currently because it's not a strong suit of mine, but um, it can work. I don't, choppy markets, Livermore always said, that's when he went fishing. He goes, choppy markets will, will cut you up. That's the thousand, you know, cuts by death thing. And a lot of those guys, um, Darvis wasn't in choppy markets. If he wasn't seeing breakouts through his box theory, he stayed out. So, I mean, I've been out most of this year just because it's too choppy for me, but um, a lot of guys are still making it, which is great um, if you can do that. But in a downtrend choppy market, I think it's a lot more difficult. In an uptrend choppy market, which we started to see last year, you still had an uptrend, but you had a lot of choppiness coming through that. Um, Mark Minervini jumped all over that and saw that occurring in February and March of last year. And he nails it. I mean, what he did was he tightened up his time frame because breakouts were still happening, but they weren't following through. And he noticed that. I'm pretty disappointed in myself. I noticed it too, but I didn't take advantage of it, especially not how Mark did. Because I went back through the history again, and Loeb and Wyckoff did that same thing during choppy markets. 
but they made sure it was choppy uptrends, not choppy downtrends. I think there's a big distinction. There. So Loeb, like I said, made money in 29, 30, 31, and 32. When the market would come up and swing up to the upside, they didn't last that long, but he would tighten up his time frames and he called himself a skittish trader back in his day. Swing trading was called skittish trading, and that's what he did. So he took advantage of those breakouts, sold them quick, and then when a market pulled back again, he was back in cash. And Minervini did that last year. It was pretty impressive what he did. So, and then I have down markets are great times to be in cash or short if you know how to do that, which is fine. Um, a lot of guys, Livermore did that really well. A lot of guys today are pretty good short traders. And a lot of them have done really well if, you, if you've been shortened since the beginning of this year or actually last fall. But the point about those is bear markets are shorter than uptrends. And if you get in a short squeeze, they're not fun to be because they can. The best, the biggest market percentage up, up days all happen in bear markets. So you get short squeezes in there and they're not fun to be in. So just for, for whatever that's worth. Um, then this point, I think, is the key to everything. Well, they're all key, but this one's the time tested strategies to your own system and personality. So what are the commonalities of those legendary traders? Concentration versus diversification. All those guys held between five to 10 stocks at any given time. That was it. If you, if you want to really see a textbook example of a great stock trader, read the uh, Darvis's book, How I Made Two Million, the end of the 50s, 58 and 59. He made most of that money. There was a time in 59 where he he had his first half million in profit. So he had a lot of, he said, some capital to work with. What he did was he took four, so the market's now ripping in 59. And he sees that and he sees stocks breaking out and going to the upside. He buys four positions, four stocks. He puts tight stops on those. He gets stopped out of the first one, I think, within a, like a week. The second one wasn't acting how he wanted to, so he cut it. So now he's down to two stocks and those start taking off. What does he do? He takes the money from the two he sold and piles them into. I mean, he pyramided up the whole time at 59. And those two stocks were it. That was the bulk of the, you know, the, the rest of what he did. So, um, concentration, um, lo uh, low with um, Montgomery Ward, uh, Chrysler with uh, in 62 with Baruch and Loeb and O'Neill, same thing. Look at um, look at O'Neill in 99, 98, 99. Man, he, he made some 300, 400 percent returns in those years by being concentrated in, you know, Charles Schwab, AOL. Those were those were massive leaders for him. And in 99, you had you had tens of I mean, 30, 40, 50, 60 stocks racing. And but he concentrated in just you know a handful. And one of the great, another great thing from him, so after the and I, Richard, I'm all over the place again. <laughs> I'm just I'm jumping all if I'm, you know, pull me back in if I need to go somewhere. But in 03, after that bear market from 02, I mean, from 2000, 01 and 02, that market came up off of the bottom in October of 02, but it still had some choppiness in November, December, 02, and then January, February of 03. But O'Neill bought eBay in October of 02. When it was coming, the market was seen to bottom out. And eBay just was a perfect pattern for him. So he buys into that. It didn't kick off any sell rules. In, in 03 then, when the market really takes off, what does he do? He piles into that. Thing. I think it was his biggest position ever in one stock. And he killed it with that one. So 
concentration over diversification. Uh, I think Loeb was this one who said diversification is you know, hedge for ignorance. So, um, so they all did concentration on the, the very few top leaders that were racing up in uptrends at their time. What else did they do? They pyramided up on the ones that they were winning with, like the Darvis example I just gave. That to me, that Darvis thing in 59 is textbook how to trade in stocks. It's never taught in any school. And it's so, it's just, he did everything right. And that's what he, you know, that's how he nailed that. Um, liquid new high growth profit leaders, not cheap stocks, not losing stocks. Uh, you know, O'Neill likes, they can have negative EPS if the future looks like it's coming right around the corner. So as far as uh, profit growth, so, and then bases, you know, there's all the bases that O'Neill named back in the day, you know, the couple of handle, the saucer base, the flat base, the, the double bottom, head and shoulders top. There's a lot of good technical books out there, um, but keep it simple. That's what these guys did. Um, chart work, no matter what the market is doing, like right now, we're in a, still a downtrend. Maybe we've bottomed, but it's key to do your chart work. Some things are looking pretty decent right now. So you need to keep an eye on this, no matter what the market's doing. Um, check the moving averages. And then they bought at new highs, stocks making new highs. Their, their adage was buy high and sell higher. And also selling, sell into strength. That is, um, that is something, one of my bigger weaknesses that I'm working on always, selling into strength. It's, it's tough to do, but um, you need to do that. Um, then get your mind right. That's the key. This first line, I, the battle is not you against the market. The battle is you against yourself. So if you think about that, that's really true. When you're losing, it's not because of the market. It's because of you. What you did, you didn't cut your loss. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You don't have to be in the market. So you need to get your mind right and make sure that it's you against yourself. And then learn to trust your intuition and control or stifle your fear, anxiety, elation, and recklessness. I got that from Wyckoff. Those were the four key traits that he said, those are the ones you need to control. So, um, you know, all these things, get your mind right, strategies fit your own system, and then I love this one. Make sure the trio traits, the three main traits are in balance. This comes from Mark Douglas. I think trading in the zone is one of the, to me, that's the master psychology book on trading. Uh, I know some people think it's a little difficult, but uh, there's so many good nuggets in that book. Um, so the trio traits that he talks about are discipline, patience is the key, create rules that don't bend or break. So. Here's the thing, you're in the market, there's no boss in the market. There's no restrictions on what you can do except how much money you have in your account. So I worked for companies for you know, 30 years. Every company, there's rules. You can't do this, you can't say that, you can't do this. And you know what those rules are so you don't break or bend the rules or the fire. Well, in the market, there's no boss. You can do anything you want, which is pretty dangerous. So that's why you have to create rules and stick by those. But what happens is because we're all human, we bend them and then we break them like Baruch did. I mean, after all that, I mean, what a huge loss that was, but he broke his rule. He knew that was wrong, but we do that. So you got to stick to those rules. And one thing that always intrigued me was, you know, how to make money in stocks by O'Neill. That, that was a turning point for me and lots of traders. It's a great book. But I always kept wondering, how come in that book, O'Neill never really talked about the psychology side? He wrote, really doesn't. He, he talks about the fundamentals a lot. He talks about the technicals and all those other things. But he doesn't really get into the psychology and the mental attitude of it. And I figured out why, it's because on that slide I showed earlier where he said, what were the things that turned it around for me? He studies mistakes and then he made these rules. He was just such a strict disciplinarian 
I think his adage was, if I'm gonna make these rules, then I'm not gonna break them. So it's hard to do that, but he was a master at that. So he's like, why create the rules if I'm gonna break them? I think it was just easier for him. So um, there's, the, there's the point, create rules that don't break or bend. And then focus, another one of the key traits from Douglas. Shut out all the noise and opinions. Price and volume will speak to you. Listen up. And then I put over here, charts should jump out to you in seconds. If you've been looking at charts for years, decades, and you scan charts, if it ju doesn't jump at you within two to three seconds and you're trying to find it, you're probably forcing yourself. And I think Minervini said this too, stocks and charts come to him. He doesn't come to them. That's a great quote. It's so true. We're gonna to get to one of those in a minute where I saw a chart in 2020, just scanning the weekly charts and went, oh my gosh, where'd this come from? This is perfect. And we're gonna to get to that in a second. And then confidence is such a key. Leave your ego behind and be aware of euphoria creeping up. Euphoria to me, and Douglas mentions this too, is the, the enemy of all stock traders. I think it has ruined more traders in history than any other thing that's out there. And the problem with it is it doesn't announce itself when it's creeping in. And it always shows up when you're winning big. And so I say here, reduce the baseball. Practice. So what do I mean by that? I don't know how many of you guys have been flat faced on the floor because you made a mistake, but I've been there more times than I care to admit, like beating the floor. What, what are you doing? So, I mean, when you're in an uptrend and you're making it and you're hitting it big, there's a couple warning signs to tell you euphoria is creeping in. The classic one is when you start taking the calculator and you know you're working somewhere else, and you go, "Oh my gosh, I made, I just made uh, whatever, whatever the number is, ten grand this week. Let's just use that. I made ten grand this week. If I could do that every week, oh my gosh, I can quit my job next week. I'm going on. I, I, I could do this forever. Well, it doesn't really work that way. So what that means is euphoria is creeping to tell you that you better be careful because a turn is coming right around the corner. So, I mean, just think of yourself in a race car. And when you're in a straightaway and you got your foot to the floor, everything's wonderful. But you better ease up off the gas when you come into a turn. In the market, when euphoria is creeping in, you're hitting the gas when you're coming around the turn. I mean, you're hitting it, your foot's to the floor. And that's what I call the baseball bat. Because it's going to hit you. The market's going to humble you down and hit you like you felt like you got hit with a baseball so I would call those the baseball, and I've had way too many baseball bad days in my life. And what I even took it a, a step further, I was so mad at myself that instead of into the strength selling it, you're hitting the gas even more. So maybe you double down or you pyramid up again on its extended stocks that are just racing to the stratosphere. Well, what that does is that creates that climax top that these top traders use to get out and the amateurs are piling in. And that's euphoria taking over. So when I've had those baseball bat days where I felt like I got slaughtered by the market, I have a little workout area in my house uh, with a heavy bag and a speed bag. I've done some boxing and martial arts in my day. I'd actually get, once I got off off the floor, I take the baseball bat and start beating the heavy bag. Now, talk about, if I had that on video, you would say that is the most uncontrolled emotion you can have in the market. Yes, it is. So you gotta stop those. Um, so that's what I call the baseball bat days. But when I was rolling in 2020, I'd always say, watch out for the baseball bat day because there's probably one right around the corner. Guess what? There it was. That forces you to sell into strength. 
So I say add historical analysis to your technical, fundamental, and psychological analysis tool. Um, you kind of do that a lot with technicals because a lot of people go back and look at history and how the bay is created and look like this, look like that. But history has such a way of repeating itself so many times that um, I just think it helped. It helped me and I'm writing these books so I can help other people, hopefully. So you go to the next slide. So over the years, I've had some people say, John, why don't you update Monster Stocks because it ended in, in uh, 06, 07, whatever. And, um, you know, I got involved in my career a lot again, so I kind of put that off. And then COVID hits in 2020, and I'm working part-time at this company, so we're all no more office, so I'm home. And I'm like, wow, more time to pay attention to the market and do all these other things I've wanted to do. And um, so 2020 was a great year for me. I had a triple-digit year, um, a lot of a lot of our performers did very well that year. So I decided to put this together because 2020 and 2021 were two totally different years in the market, even though they were both up years and kind of up the same amount of percentages, except for the NASDAQ had a great year in 2020. So I put this, it was it's kind of a chart book. Um, and it's basically another study guide. But in it, I interviewed like six of the top traders for 2020 and I did uh, intervening in 2021. So you can see how those guys navigated through those markets. And it's repeating what I, all the other history. So I say, get to know MVP stocks. I call an MVP stock, a stock, how it acts at moving averages, that's the M, volume action, that's the B, and price is P. So MVP stocks are the ones you want to MVP stocks, which are above all the moving averages, are moving up on volume and price. Those become your monster stocks. Always have in history, they all follow the same patterns. They all follow the same action. And the goal is to get in on a few of them. You're never going to get them all. You're never going to get the majority of them. But you only need a handful, two or three, really. And if you do them right, you're going you're gonna to have great returns. Um, so learn the similarities. I show this throughout there. Study their charts and see the trends change. Um, analyze price action. Watch for volume clues. Track those key moving averages. Engage the new high, new lows. And you can't get too far off track. So in 2020, we had the big, we had the swift short bear market, of course, with COVID in March. And I go through that in the book. And then we come up off of that in April. And I'm watching the market and I'm like, God, this, you know, there's some, some movers here. But the early movers were Zoom and DocuSign because lifestyles were changing and work environment, et cetera. And so those charts looked just like the other previous monster stocks from all the other errors as they're coming off a decline. And they were in IBD and I post, Every Sunday, I try to post a few leaders what they're doing, and they were in there. And so I came into the market in mid-April, and that that uptrend, I mentioned this earlier, that uptrend was very strong. And you could have made your whole year in four months right there and, and done it and walked away and had a triple-digit year for sure. And some of those guys that I, I interview, uh, Oliver Kell, 900%, I mean, Geez, read his story in there. And he did it on just a few stocks. Tesla was his big winner. And he piled into that. I mean, when I say pile in, he had 70% of his account in that one stock. And he was just, you know, Tesla in summer and the fall of 2020 was just ripping. And he was all over that. Eve Bobach, who works with Ropel, she was all over that. A lot of these guys were in the same stock because those were the leaders. And I mentioned a little while ago, what was a perfect, the most perfect base I think I saw in 2020, this was mid to late April, right after the market turns was Livongo Health. And IBD had it in the paper. I put it up on my, on my uh, watch list. And I was like, 
this thing looks perfect. The base, uh, the liquidity of it, and what it was doing with COVID. You know, it's a health company trying to fix COVID and all that other stuff. And um, it was just a perfect. That's one of those stocks where I said earlier, if it just if it doesn't jump out at you in two seconds or three seconds, you may be forcing it. That thing jumped out in two seconds. Where did this come from? And that stock was probably the easiest stock to ride in 2020 because it broke out in April and it ran up in August and it gave you the greatest sell signal of all time. It got bought out at like 140. That's the perfect sell signal. It, the market made the signal for you. As soon as a, a merger announcement's made, sell the stock because it's not going anywhere else. The market will move it to the buyout point and then you're done. And uh, Oliver Kell was in that one. Matt Caruso was in that one. They got in right at the breakouts of 25. They ran it up to 140, 130, 400% returns in four, four and a half months. Beautiful. And it was a beautiful base. It looked just like all the other, it looked like Chrysler from 62. I mean, it was, it was right there. And um, it's a great stock to work. Um, there were all those others, Tesla, and but the point I made in the book is when you get to 2021, the market started changing. I mentioned this earlier, you know, February, March, you started to get some choppiness, but it wasn't just choppiness, it was sector rotation. You didn't see that in 2020. So in 2021, now in the spring and especially the summer, you're getting these these stocks rolling in and then they roll right out. So steel was up there for a while. And I know Minervini was in those. And then that's why he shortened up his time frame. He saw this happening. He saw sector rotation happen, quick turns, and he nails it. So, cause he's, he was watching what the market was doing and it was totally different than 2020. And so some of these stocks, so if you wanna go to the next, so I'm gonna show you a couple pages from the book. So this shows in the back of the book, I have some of the monster stocks from 2020 that more than doubled in that year. And then the same stock under it in 2021. Now these are calendar charts. So there's Zoom. That was a great run. And people thought Zoom is going to be great forever, right? Everybody's going to be on Zoom. Everybody, we're doing it now. The whole world's going to be on Zoom. Well, the, the market didn't think so. Um, and it gave off all these sell signals. Look at these breaks between these moving average lines. Look at the volume on these breaks. Then go to 2021. Look at this downtrend. Everything's under the moving averages. Go back to 2020. Look at that uptrend. Everything's above. Look at the volume kicking on the right up. Look at the volume kicking in on the right down. So you had that one. And then what's the next one there? Peton, uh, Peloton. Is that right? Yeah, my old eyes here. Yeah. Um, another one, and then uh, Eve nailed that one. She rode that one straight up, sold it near the top, got out. When it cuts those lines, she's gone. And these stocks, these 2021 charts, that's they're way worse than that now. This was just the end of 2021. So you want to be in these on the ride up. You want to look for the sell signals and get out instead of riding them all the way back down. Because, like I said earlier, some of these big funds are, they're still sitting on these things. Why do you want to round trip that? So the next slide, I think I showed two more. Um, so same thing, same thing again here. Who is this? Um, it is, no, and there, there's Roku. Look at, look at these, the same, these, the point is the same pattern. So April of 2020, look at these stocks coming out of those bases back at that point. They flatten out, perfect times to pyramid your position up, right off a moving average line, volume comes in. You know, there's earnings announcements, you can pull back before an announcement, then you, you know, if it gaps up, you're back in, et cetera, et cetera. Ride this up, then they start getting choppy. Look at the choppiness. Look at the difference between both of those stocks in 2020. And then the beginning of 2021, especially when you get to February, March, look how choppy they get. That's what was happening in the market. Choppiness coming all over from sector rotation. Then these two, 
both break down by the summer and they're gone. They've been, they're way worse today than you just see on these charts. So why do you want to sit with that? That's these guys, all the guys I mentioned, Baruch, they, they were out of these things. If they were trading today, they would not be buying these things down. That's not how they made all their successes. So it pays to pay attention to what these stocks are doing. It pays, and you don't need all, in my mind, uh, some people disagree with this, that's fine. You don't need all those technical pieces. I mean, moving averages, just look at what the difference of a moving average is. What's the stock moving on average? Well, that's what I want to be. I want to be moving with it in an average that's either going up or I want to be out of it or short it if it's going down. And that's all moving averages are. And the 50 day, a lot of guys are using 21 day moving averages these days. They weren't that popular back then. But I mean, there's a lot of short term traders using 10 day line. So um, let me just make this one comment too. O'Neill used the 50 day. Ropel says this a lot when he does his, his webcast that O'Neill never used the 21 day. So when I was writing monster stocks, I was putting the 20, I put the 21 day in those charts and I had to send them to O'Neill. I was like, he's going to kill me. He never used the 21 day. He's probably going to reject the whole, the whole book. Well, I got his edits back and they were all, he's, he's like, great job, John. And he was like, I was like, oh, oh thanks. Man. It's like, so I kept it in there and they're, it's popular. I mean, it's been popular for a while. A lot of traders use the 21 day line. And I have them on all those charts in that book. And you can see when they cut that, and especially when they cut through that 50 day, the trend is over. The uptrend is over by then. So that's what, that's what those guys did. And I didn't invent any of this stuff. I, I want to make clear that I didn't create anything. I am just studying history. What did these guys do that were successful? What was the market doing? How did they navigate through it? What were the stocks doing? They're very similar depending on what the market, what stage it's in, what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And these, these things repeat themselves. So I didn't create anything. I'm just taking the information I found and putting it in book form so people can have it and you can reference it and look back on it. So that's what I've done. So if you want to flip to the next one, I know we're getting late on time, but. So this is my top 50. I put this on Twitter the other day in uh, word format. Here's the view of it. So my books came from a lot of these books and those books on the right, those two stacks are in my opinion, just my opinion, the top 15 trading books ever. And 10 of them were written before 1990 to prove that nothing's changing. I mean, it's human nature's in there and Livermore said it. The only thing, the pockets change, but nothing else changes. You know, the names, the names will change, the pockets will change, but nothing else because human nature is what it is. So these are the books that I use the most. There's a couple of Wyckoff books in there, Studies in Stock Speculation. Uh, there's Reminiscences, of course, which is a popular. There's the, the one by uh, Humphrey Neal that I think is very underrated uh, from 1930. There's The Battle for Investment Survival, Lowe's book. There's Darvis's book, of course, O'Neill's book, uh, How to Trade in Stocks by Livermore. Um, Darvis wrote another book in 1977, just before his untimely death, called You Can Still Make It in the Market. It's a fantastic book. He talks about how he stayed out of this market in 73, 74. The mid-70s were a disaster. And um, how he stayed out of that and just waited. And then 75, 76, the market's coming up and he's back in it, just like he did back in the 50s. So another just a great story. Trading in the zone and trade like an O'Neill disciple from Morales and Catcher, I think it's fantastic. Um, Mark Minervini's books are just great books. And then Weinstein's book is just a classic that stands the test of time. And then another unknown or not as known much, 
The Perfect Speculator. It's just a great short read. It's a fictionized story. So you need to know that. But he wrote it to say, this is what a perfect speculator would look like. So the more you can read that and adhere to that, probably will help you out. So one thing as I was looking at Weinstein's book right here, um, he also mentions the new high, new low importance tracking that in that book. So you had uh, Haller doing it, you had Loeb doing it, you had Elder doing it, you had Weinstein doing it. And you know, it's it goes back decades. It's not something that I just made up this year or anything. I got it from other people. I got everything from other people. I didn't make anything up. So um so I think any quite where do you want to go from here, Richard? Well, John, first, yeah, first, first of all, first I just want to oh let me mute you real quick. Uh, John, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for that amazing presentation. We've got so many great comments in the chat just saying uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much. Um, and like thinking back when you're talking about O'Neill, um, you know, losing money in that bear market in 60. Uh, I was just talking with Stan Weinstein and he was getting started right in that same time. And also he lost a lot of money and that convinced him to look for a technical method. So it's interesting how the parallels line up. Um, we don't have too much time for questions, I think. Uh, there were just a, a few about um, if people want to go out and do this for themselves and, and study history, what would be kind of your advice for, for people who want to do that? Well, I think, you know, O'Neill's book talks a lot about that. I think his recent editions, his last editions of How to Make Money in Stocks, the first 100 pages are just charts and he marks them up for you. You can learn so much just by looking at that. I think that's key, you know. Um, yeah, I don't like to pump my own books, but it, that, there's so much history in there I got from all those other ones. So I kind of condensed it down if you don't want to, you know, I read probably a couple hundred books on the market. And I was just like, why, why can't we just have them in a clean, concise, little handy guide? So that's kind of why I did it. But they're all good. I mean, reminiscences is just the story style talk, but it's it's just fascinating to, to read through that. And there's tons of history in there about what he did right, what you know, Livermore was probably the greatest boom trader ever, but he was a bus trader too. So he did the boom and bus cycle. And, um, you know, these other guys didn't do that. So you, you got to know how to control that. And that's from, that comes from each individual. So I'm getting off track again. Anyway, there's, <laughs> there's lots of history books. I, it, the whole uh, bibliography from my second book was a bunch of history books on Wall Street that I used as references to write that book. So, Oh, they're all on Amazon, so so that's they're all in ebook and paperback, so you can get them there. Perfect. Unfortunately, I want to ask a few more questions. Maybe we've got time for one here. Um, I'd love to hear what you're looking for now. You know, given all this historical analysis of of you know full market cycles. What are some of the indicators that you're looking for to suggest that we might be starting a new bull market? Uh, you mentioned new highs, new lows, um, what leaders, leaders are doing, all of that. What would all these great traders be looking for? Well, I mean, there's so much talk about, are we at a bottom? Have we found the bottom? We may have. I mean, it's been choppy recently along a bottom type of thing. Um, you know, moving averages that are in decline, like you want to get over those because what was it last week? The Nasdaq bumped its head up on. I put that out on Twitter. I said, "Watch this. If it bumps its head on the 50-day and gets decline again, it's going to be shot back down." So you need to get over those. There's going to be if this is an uptrend. If this really is a bottom and there's an uptrend starting, there's going to be plenty of time to get into these things. Um, I want to see the indexes get over some of these resistance moving averages that they keep running up into. I want to see new highs and new highs get over new lows. There should be a trend there of at least three, five, seven days in a row and then build on that. That helps. But more important, you got to see these stocks building bases. There's some interesting things out there right now. So, um, which I couldn't, I don't think we could say that a month ago. So some things are starting to form. Maybe that's it. Um, you know, what would really help is if the Fed said, you know, we're just going to raise one or two more times and we're done. I mean, history, if you go back in history, man, that really fuels gasoline to an uptrend. So there's that all. Can I get one more thing in? I don't know if you're. 
Yeah, I think one more thing. We've got just one or two more minutes. So this was interesting. I put this out on Twitter a little while back. Go back 1942, 1962, 1982, and 2002, and 2022. All of them 20 years apart. All of them had horrendous six, first six months of each year. Now, that's just probably just a coincidence, but it happened. And every single one of those, an upturn came soon after that, after the first half of the year. So in 02, we had that upturn in October, where the market bottomed in, in October. In 82, which this one looks a bit similar to me in, you had a bottoming in August of 82. In 1962, you had another October bottom. And then in 1942, you had another uh, August bottom. So. I'm like, all right, every 20 years? So, okay, everybody take their calendars out and go to 2042 and just say, watch out. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it'll happen again, but all those 20 year cycles have done the same thing, but then they recouped fairly soon after that. Tip, uh, what, two, three of them in August, two of them in October, but we need the Fed to come up off the gas. We need inflation to contain. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to happen, but. Um, those three things, I think you got to get the indexes up over the moving averages. You got to get new highs starting to come in, but you have more importantly, you have to have new leadership forming solid bases. And there's some of those out there right now, which is a bit encouraging. So, Perfect. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think we'll have to have you back on sometime soon for another podcast or interview or something, because there's so many questions coming in. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's definitely a little bit different than everything else at this conference, but it's extremely valuable information. So thank you, John. And thanks uh, for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Of course. And we'll be right back with Dr. Wish. So stay tuned in about 10 minutes at 2.40 PM Eastern time. Uh, so we'll be right back. Take care.